Are you fascinated by old photographs, reminiscing about the past and contemplating? An antique photo always captivates, makes one ponder, and allows us to time travel to the past, attempting to unravel all its mysteries. In this video, we'll share with you 10 photographs with mysterious plots and remarkable stories from the past. Take a look at this photograph. Would you believe it was an authentic shot if you saw it in the early 20th century? This story is about how two young girls convinced the entire world of the existence of fairies. The tale began in 1917. Two cousins, Elsie Wright and Francis Griffiths, aged 17 and 10, often played near a stream. There, they created a series of photographs showing their interaction with fairies. In total, the girls made five pictures, which they presented as genuine evidence of the existence of fairies. The first photograph, featuring Francis with dancing fairies, was taken by Elsie using her father's camera. This shot was titled, Francis and the Fairy Ring. Elsie's father immediately suspected forgery, as Elsie was a talented artist with experience in retouching, but he found no concrete evidence. In 1920, the photos reached the editorial office of London's Strand magazine, after which the story became a mass frenzy. Elsie and Francis became famous throughout England and soon, the world. These photographs caught the interest of Arthur Conan Doyle, the famous author of the Sherlock Holmes stories, who was seriously into spiritualism at the time. Initially, experts who studied the photos were divided over their authenticity. However, Conan Doyle, disregarding authoritative experts, published an article in the Christmas issue of a popular magazine. This article attracted widespread attention. Throughout this time, Elsie and Francis gave interviews, met with celebrities, and everywhere firmly maintained that the photographs were genuine. The truth about the photos only emerged decades later. In 1983, an elderly Elsie finally confessed that they had cut out the fairies from paper and molded the gnome from clay. Clips, threads, and hat pins served as fasteners. Arthur Conan Doyle was fortunate that by the time of this confession, he had long passed away. The sisters claimed their intention was not to deceive the public, but rather to avoid trouble, and they certainly didn't want to upset their idol Arthur Conan Doyle, who believed in them. Interestingly, to this day, there are many who believe in the authenticity of the Cottingley fairies. After all, Conan Doyle couldn't be wrong. But we can't be fooled by such things anymore, right? Before we continue, let me remind you that you can subscribe to our channel right now, Hit the bell icon to not miss our new releases. And now, let's continue. What would happen if an entire country with left-hand traffic suddenly switched to right-hand traffic? You don't need to wonder for long, because this actually happened in Sweden. By the mid-20th century, Sweden remained the only country in continental Europe with left-hand traffic. Due to the Industrial Revolution, delaying the transition to right-hand traffic became dangerous, and economically disadvantageous. Recognizing the complexity of such a transition, four years were allocated for preparation. A special commission was established to assess the scale of the preparations needed. It was necessary not only to reconstruct roads, apply new markings, install road signs, and adapt public transport, but also to prepare the population. Information was everywhere, from advertising on milk cartons and clothing to educational programs. The cost of reorganizing traffic amounted to approximately $120 million. Then came the day of the transition. The exact time was 5 a.m. on September 3, 1967. But, as the photograph clearly shows, the transition was not without difficulty. Nevertheless, thanks to enforced speed reductions in the first few months of the transition and clear traffic regulation, road casualties were avoided. There were only seven minor accidents registered. This truly was a historic event and achievement for Sweden. The Babushka Lady is the most mysterious witness to the assassination of John Kennedy. The media dubbed her so because of her headscarf, reminiscent of a Russian grandmother, which was untypical for an American woman. Researchers have scrutinized photographs from the assassination site of the 35th President of the USA time and again. The babushka lady was present in numerous photographs, never letting go of her camera and continuing to impassively film the tragedy scene while other eyewitnesses scattered. 
From her vantage point, it was possible to capture the location from where the shots were fired. After the incident, the police asked the public to provide any information about the mysterious woman, but no details were forthcoming. She seemed to have vanished. In search of fame, several women attempted to pass themselves off as the Babushka Lady, possibly the most important witness to John Kennedy's assassination. A popular theory is that she could have been the dancer Beverly Oliver, who made a shocking confession in 1970. However, many considered the American woman's words to be false. She claimed to have filmed all the events on a Yashica Super 8 camera, and the film was confiscated by supposed FBI agents. But there was a discrepancy, as this camera model was only released several years after the assassination. Besides, the dancer was only 17 years old at the time, whereas the babushka lady appears much older in the photographs, and her build does not match that of a nightclub dancer. There are various theories about who the mysterious lady could have been. Some assert she was just a passerby. There's also a theory that the lady was somehow connected to Kennedy's killers. She could have been a secret agent of the special services, or even a Russian spy, or possibly a journalist. But to this day, the identity and potential footage that the babushka lady could have taken remain one of the great unsolved mysteries of the Kennedy assassination. The story of the ghost hand is quite intriguing. In this photograph, taken over a hundred years ago, a group of girls working at a linen factory is depicted. The fourth girl from the right in the second row is Ellen Donnelly, on whose shoulder rests a hand that seems to belong to no one else in the picture, as all the girls standing next to her have their hands crossed. The stir was caused by a member of a popular forum who posted the photo online, prompting a local resident named Linda to respond, recognizing the photograph and her grandmother Ellen Donnelly in it. While she claimed not to believe in ghosts, she recalled several strange events associated with this photograph. One of the realist's prevalent opinions is that it was a flaw in the old photograph. However, the defects seem too conveniently arranged, as the fingers of this mysterious limb can be discerned, and it can even be identified as a right hand. The origin or explanation of the ghost hand remains a mystery to this day. Salem, a city already shrouded in mystery due to its historic witch trials, has also been linked to more intriguing stories involving UFOs. The latest sightings of unidentified flying objects were quite recent. In 2019, witnesses observed several orbs hovering over the city, a phenomenon not new to Salem. The most discussed and intriguing UFO event occurred on July 16, 1952, when a Coast Guard serviceman, Shell Alpert, saw four glowing lights in the sky. He managed to photograph them before the objects began to dim and then disappeared entirely. This photograph has been published in numerous books, newspapers, and magazines. The increased popularity of UFOs was associated with the initiation in 1947 of the U.S. Air Force's Project Blue Book, whose main goal was to search for unidentified flying objects, such as spy planes and other military developments. Many believed that the Air Force was searching for extraterrestrial beings. In the early 1950s, the number of reports of suspicious objects increased annually. However, after extensive work collecting and studying reports of these strange sightings, Project Blue Book concluded that most UFO sightings could be explained by natural or anthropogenic phenomena. Despite the discontinuation of investigations and the closure of the project, public fascination with searching for UFOs has not ceased and continues to capture our imagination to this day. The ship Bannock Burn was a steel-hulled cargo vessel that disappeared on Lake Superior on November 21, 1902, with 20 sailors aboard. The shipwreck's location was never discovered, nor were the bodies of the deceased. This ship became known as the Flying Dutchman of the Great Lakes, and its mysterious sinking spawned numerous legends and ghostly tales. The cargo ship Bannock Burn had already sunk twice. In 1897, it collided with a lock's sidewall, causing a severe leak, and the second time, the vessel ran aground. In both instances, there were no casualties. The ship was repaired and continued its voyages. Fast forward to November 20th, 1902. The Bannock Burn embarked on its final journey. 
On the night of the presumed sinking, it was spotted near Cape Kiwinaw without any visible damage. That night, a severe winter storm erupted, but no distress signals were sent from the ship. After the storm, the Bannock Burn was never seen again, vanishing without a trace. However, the story doesn't end there. Sightings of the ship continued for many years, fueling the legend of this ghost ship. In September 2018, a two-year-old girl named Faviola was found dead under suspicious circumstances, while under the care of her mother's boyfriend, Lalo Anthony Castillo. Medical staff reported bruises on the little girl's head, face, and ribs. Castillo was arrested on charges of child abuse. However, he was released a year later. But the story of the little girl didn't end there. Faviola's mother began to notice that toys and personal items mysteriously disappeared from her daughter's grave. This prompted her to seek help from cemetery workers to find the vandal. Other parents facing a similar situation, whose son's grave had been vandalized, suspected the murderer, still at large, and decided to install a surveillance camera on a nearby tree. The camera captured astonishing footage of a small child wandering around the cemetery at night. The next day, when the family took the images to the cemetery workers, they accidentally ran into Faviola's mother. The footage was shocking to Sandra. She firmly believed that the girl in the video was her daughter. The parents believed that the tragic circumstances of the deceased connected them, as both had not achieved justice. The story captured on camera remains a mystery to this day. In 1922, on a small isolated farm in Bavaria, one of the most gruesome and unsolved crimes in German history took place. The bodies of all who lived on the farm were found on April 4, 1922. The head of the family, Andreas, his wife, Casilia, their daughter, Victoria, with her two children, and a newly arrived maid. The bodies of four victims, with their heads bludgeoned by a mattock, were piled up in a heap at the barn's doorway, covered with hay and an old door. Two more, the maid and the youngest family member, two-year-old Yosef, were found dead in their rooms. Needless to say, the mass murder of the family was beyond brutality. In the days leading up to this horrific event, Andreas Gruber reported seeing strange occurrences around the farm. Footprints in the snow leading to the house, a newspaper that no one in the family had bought, and the disappearance of a house key. The investigation spawned numerous theories, but no concrete answers. Initially, it was suspected to be a robbery, but this theory was dismissed as money was found in the house. Another peculiar fact is that, according to the evidence found, the murderer continued to live in the Gruber's house for several days after the crime, taking care of the livestock, stoking the stove, and lighting lamps. Moreover, he might have secretly lived in the attic for months before the murder itself. The crime inspired several feature and documentary films. It has been a case study for future forensic experts. Various suspects were considered during the investigation, but no one was arrested and the case remains unsolved to this day. There is a remarkable painting in the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, Madonna with Saint Giovannino, attributed to Domenico Ghirlandaio. It depicts a traditional nativity scene, but with an interesting deviation. In the window over Madonna's shoulder, in the right corner, a tiny man with a dog can be seen intently observing some indiscernible spot in the sky, a flying saucer. Upon closer inspection, we see that rays emanate from it in all directions. While UFOs in medieval paintings were not uncommon, this is just one of numerous medieval paintings depicting strange, eerie, unidentified flying objects. One cannot help but marvel at the sharp wit of the Italian artist. Another intriguing UFO sighting case occurred near Falcon Lake in Manitoba, Canada. An amateur geologist named Stefan Michalak had an unusual experience, and since then, this photo has become a well-known UFO sighting case in Canada. Michalak, who was prospecting for minerals, encountered a suspicious object. He described it as a large metallic disc with the shape of a classic flying saucer, having a strange changing color. He also noted a strong stream of warm air with a sulfur smell coming from the object. When Stefan approached the object, it emitted a jet of hot gas, causing serious burns on his chest, resembling a grid pattern. Following this incident, 
the man experienced health problems reminiscent of radiation sickness. Over the next two years, Mikalak was examined several times and became the focus of a great number of governmental and non-governmental organizations. Despite thorough and extensive investigations, the nature of Mikalak's experience was never determined. Adding to the intrigue, strange traces and scorched plants were found at the site, as well as radioactive material. Stefan Mikalak always believed he had encountered some experimental device but never claimed it to be of extraterrestrial origin. His story was detailed in his book and continues to be a topic of discussion among UFO enthusiasts and skeptics. Which of these photographs intrigued you the most? We look forward to your responses in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. Your engagement is the best reward for us. Thank you for your attention. See you soon.